Hey guys, it's me. In this video, we're going to talk about how to fix a broken metabolism. This is the most important thing you need to know. So if you're doing anything right now that's distracting you, put it away, get a piece of paper, take notes, okay? The first thing I need to do is give you a little foundation so you understand what I'm going to talk about next, okay? So I'm going to kind of build on this. So, so as we go, just take notes. Number one, there's some the facts about the metabolism is that when you go on a diet, you will slow your metabolism. So dieting slows your metabolism. If you've dieted for many, many years, then your metabolism is very, very slow. If you've never dieted, then your metabolism is probably a lot faster, okay? So dieting also increases hunger and cravings. If you ever look at the show, The Biggest Loser, they always make it look so, you know, like dramatic. Like how can they lose all that weight? But what happens, when these guys start losing, they start slowing down and slowing down where it's really, really tough until they have to exercise so hard to get off that last bit of weight. It's crazy. And then they don't show, they have to sign a waiver. Many of these people gain the weight right back, okay? And I'll tell you why in a second. So also, age slows your metabolism. Surprise, you're probably already finding it out. So um, exercise will increase hunger and cravings too with some people, but mainly hunger because you're, you're burning stuff up, you're gonna want more. Um, and the last thing is it's very unnatural to lose weight, very unnatural. Losing weight is anti-survival because fat is a survival mechanism. So when you try to lose it, it goes against the survival. So really we need to dive in like the understanding of what that is so we can undo it. But we're talking really about your set point and the set point is the point at which your body very uh, likes to be weight-wise. It just settles into the certain point. It doesn't like to go below that. It might not even go higher than that, but it likes to settle down at a certain point. So my goal is to help you in this video show you how to lower that set point. So for example, let's say your set point is 182 and you want to get to 142. So we need to drop the set point. And that's really the metabolism point where your body kind of settles into it, likes to the body just likes to be the same. It doesn't like to um, go down too much because that's starvation, right? So what we want to do is give you uh, the next part of this, a foundation of how, how we're going to fix the set point. But first we have to talk about what destroys the set point beyond just dieting, okay? So let me show you that. Okay, so here's what you need to know. Number one, you have this thing called the pancreas. It's located underneath your left rib cage, and the pancreas has about a million islands of cells, okay? And there's these little, little tiny, uh, it looks like little ions, uh, islands in a, uh, a bunch of tissue, and they call it Islands of Langerhans after the guy's name who discovered it. But there's different cells, and they're called alpha, beta, delta cells. Um, the beta cells are the ones that we're gonna talk about first. Uh, and 60% of those cells are beta cells, okay? And the other 40% are other cells. Now, what is beta cells? The beta cells make insulin, okay? So that's what they do. So insulin is most known for regulating uh, sugar, right, and carbohydrates. So what insulin does is it lowers the sugar in the blood, okay? So that's what you need to, I'm gonna kind of build on this, but you need to understand that. So insulin lowers the sugar, and but the other thing is that insulin also has other functions that uh, a lot of people don't realize. Number one, it uh, affects fat metabolism. It affects protein metabolism, okay? So it makes, it converts sugar into cholesterol. It converts sugar into triglycerides, those are blood fats. It basically increases the tension on the arteries, increasing blood pressure. It retains sodium, okay? It drives protein or amino acids into the cells. And, um, so a, and we'll get more into that in a, in a bit, but I wanted just to have you understand that protein, uh, insulin has a lot more to do just, just in carbohydrate metabolism. But for your uh, viewpoint, what you need to know right now is that it's the thing that makes you makes fat. It's the primary regulator that makes you fat, and it actually blocks any chance of burning fat. 
in the presence of a little bit of insulin, you're not going to burn fat, period, okay? And this is out of guidance physiology, um, and this is a known fact. So it'll make you fat and blocks the release of fat. Okay, so we have insulin that is triggered by a high carbohydrate meal. You probably already know that. You, know, you eat some bread, you increase sugar, and what happens, your body will store that into a stored sugar called glycogen. So glycogen is a series of glucose uh, molecules stuck together, okay? It needs potassium to be stored. So we got stored sugar and then anything excess that turns into fat, okay? So we have a combination of stored sugar and fat, okay? That's what insulin does. And so what happens though with a lot of people is they start getting a fatty liver. So it's really the insulin that makes the fatty liver, um, especially if the person is not consuming alcohol, all right? And then insulin, if gone on too far, will destroy proteins, yeah. Muscle wasting, all the, I mean, think about what part of your body is protein. You got intracellular proteins, you have uh, like so many different proteins. Your body is gonna waste those and it's gonna convert those into sugar and it's going to leave uh, carbon skeletons. So it's just basically going to leave the waste and it's going to convert everything else to sugar. And basically, that's what destroys a diabetic is that they get uh, clogged arteries, a stroke, uh, they have their kidneys fail, and then they have protein destruction. That's why they usually have protein coming out of the kidneys and they destroy that. And so you have everything that kind of spills off into the rest of the tissue. So it's a very ugly, destructive disorder. Um, and then what happens normally, this is supposed to happen, is before a meal, you should have a blood sugar between, let's say, 75 and 90. Like, it's say 80 and 90, okay? But normal, also, it can go up to 100. So let's say between 80 and 100. That's normal before you eat, okay? Um, what happens, though, when you eat, the blood sugar should normally spike up um, to like 120, it can even go up, up to like 140 after a meal, okay? But the closer you get to 140, the more you're becoming a problem. So if it's above 140, then you become more diabetic because of diabetes, you have this spike in sugar because the insulin's not there to keep it in check. So it's out of control. So what happens normally is you eat, it kind of spikes to 120, and then it comes back down to normal after two to three hours. That's normal because the insulin controls that blood sugar. But in a diabetic situation, it raises too high, out of control, you get tired, brain fog, and then it takes a long time to come back and reset, okay? So, so now let's go on to the next part. High insulin over time, or plus time, equals insulin resistance. Now, a good analogy would be, let's say you live underneath a train track, and there's a train that goes over your house and you live like, um, there's like a metro or something. And um, at first you can't sleep because it's so noisy, but over time you, you become desensitized, you don't hear it anymore because you get used to it. So same thing being exposed to an antibiotic, you become antibiotic resistant, okay? So when you have too much of a hormone, especially insulin, the, the receptor that's supposed to receive that hormone gets altered, it compensates, it downgrades, so it doesn't absorb it. So basically, your body's trying to reject insulin because it's too high, okay? So what causes insulin resistance is too much insulin, okay? So you have a situation where you have too much insulin, but you also have not enough insulin in certain places of your body, like in the cells and in the blood, but we have too much insulin in other places. So you could have symptoms of both hyper and hypoglycemia, interesting. So let's go through the symptoms. Fatty liver, okay? If you have a fatty liver, you have insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, you have a fatty liver because one thing will also cause another because some of the fat in the liver actually releases certain inflammatory responses that make you insulin resistant. So it's really a, a nasty double-edged sword. Brain fog, okay? High fasting insulin. So even when you're not eating sugar, the insulin is still high in certain places of your body. Remember, insulin blocks fat burning. Okay, belly fat, bloating, digestive issues, sleep 
Sleepy after a meal. Let's say you eat lunch and you have to take a nap. That's classic insulin resistance. High blood, sh uh, blood pressure. Why? Because uh, insulin causes tension within the arteries. Um, cravings and hunger. <clears throat> well, wait a second. That's a low insulin situation, but it's an insulin resistant symptom, but it's really certain parts of your body have a low um, insulin because the cell won't let it kind of connect. So you're basically craving and hungry all the time. Dark pigment in your folds, of, in different folds of your body, like your groin, your armpits, your neck, you have a little darker pig pigmentation. That can happen in advanced stages. And hunger between meals. So you can't go a uh, long period of time without getting hungry or having a blood sugar issue. That's insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is the single biggest problem for that controls your set point. It destroys your set point. Okay? Why? Because insulin is, is the hormone that tells your body whether to burn fat or not. Okay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to become more clear as we go through the next part too. So insulin increases fat, prevents the burning of fat, <clears throat> and controls and destroys your set point. Other than that, it's perfectly fine. Let me show you the next part. Okay, so now the big question is what causes insulin resistance, okay? High insulin, but what causes insulin to spike, right? You already know it's sugar, but there's some other things that will increase insulin as well. And that would be protein. Some types of protein more than others, okay? And what I'm talking about is I'm talking about, see, protein doesn't trigger glucose. So you probably heard of the glycemic index, right? Well, that's the level of the foods that trigger the sugars. But have you ever heard of the insulin index? Completely different. Okay, I'm going to talk about that in the next section. But the point is there are um, other factors that will increase insulin that don't increase glucose. It's, this, is, this explains why you probably are eating healthy, no sugars, and you're still not it losing weight. Now, before you get freak out and say, hey, I have to, now I have to give up protein, hear me out, okay, because there's some other solutions. But the point is that, especially if you're eating a large amount of proteins, but protein does trigger insulin to some degree. If we look at the different types of um, proteins, well, let me just say that to the next one. But gastrointestinal hormones, what does that mean? It means that there are hormones in your, your GI tract that also increase insulin. So really, every time you eat, you increase insulin, okay? So there's a couple of foods that don't increase insulin. I'll, I'll get into that in the next section. But the point I'm trying to make is that there's other things that are messing you up other than just the sugar. Uh, estrogen increases insulin as well. Yeah, that explains why uh, women, when they get pregnant, they go through the menstrual cycle, they get fatter, okay? Especially if the estrogen is too high. So... Um, so we're going to talk about the insulin index in the next section. All right, now check this out. This is the insulin index, okay? Very different than the glycemic index for the most part. But look at butter. It's 2%. It's very, very low. Uh, it does, barely triggers insulin at all, just slightly, okay? Olive oil, 3%. Coconut oil, 3%. So really all the fats are... There's no stimulation, and this is why you can get away with eating the fat uh, more than going low fat because watch what happens. As we go up the scale, we have low fat yogurt, 76%. So when you go low fat cheese, we get rid of the buffer for the insulin, and the protein is higher, and you get more insulin. So all these low fat things at the store are creating insulin problems because they're not using the fat as a buffer for insulin. And that's why even the ice cream recipe that I have is that the heavy cream, look at heavy cream is 4%, okay? That's low. It doesn't stimulate insulin. So it's not going to, it's not going to destroy the set point. It's not going to create a problem. Now you can eat too much of it, but the point is that um, it's not going to be, the importance of getting rid of it is very, very minimal. Okay? So it's, it's much more important to avoid the higher insulin things. But check this out. Egg yolk, 15%. That's pretty low. But look at the egg, the whole egg, no, I'm sorry, the egg whites is 55%. 
how many people do you know that just do egg whites thinking they're doing themselves some good and they're not doing the egg yolk? The egg yolk is much better for weight loss. If we combine the egg yolk with the egg whites, we get the whole egg, it's, it brings it down to 21%. So by adding fat with a meal, you're actually helping the situation. Now, it is true when you go through ketosis, you can you could be burning your own uh, your dietary fat and not your own fat, but don't be afraid to consume whole things. Don't go lean at all, okay? Don't be afraid to use some butter. Don't be afraid to use some of these products. So look at this. We got pecans, very, very low. Uh, bacon, 9%. See, in your mind, you're probably like, well, I need some lean bacon. No, you don't. You want the fattier bacon because the leaner the protein, the more it spikes insulin. Um, peanut butter, 11%. Cheese, 15%. Turkey, 23%. Berries, 47 Look at beef, 51%. So <clears throat> these people that do the Atkins diet, let's say they do it the first time it works. The second time, it doesn't really work as well. The third time, it doesn't work at all. Why? Because dieting slows the metabolism. It destroys the set point, And they're actually increasing their insulin. Um, not as bad as a sugar person, but that's really what happens. Look at apple, 75%, low-fat yogurt, 76%, banana, 84%, whole wheat bread, 96%, baked beans, 100%, potatoes, 121%. I'm going to give you a download. You can download um, this page in the download section. So you have a whole list of this. And I will also um, share in the extra section uh, some food plans to show you what food you should be eating just to take it one, one step further, okay? Now... Uh, so I'm just bringing your awareness up that there are foods that are messing you up that are not necessarily sugars, okay? And I want to show you next um, this one little point here, which is very, very, very important. And, and I know I kind of uh, spent a lot of time getting to this point, but this is the most important point of this whole presentation. Okay, so if, if high levels of insulin over a period of time cause insulin resistance, then what happens is we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? So here's the problem. When we eat, even the hormones in our digestive tract spike insulin. Boom, okay, so we know we're going to get rid of the sugar and all that, and that's great. But if you snack in between the meals, if you're snacking, even with healthy things, okay, you're spiking the insulin. So we never have a chance to correct insulin resistance. So you must shoot for three meals a day or two. Not to lower calories because we're going to increase some fat, but simply to correct the insulin resistance. Now, how do you know if you have insulin resistance? Well, all those symptoms. If you have belly fat, if you, uh, you have, you're going to have a fatty liver. If you have a fatty liver, you're going to have insulin resistance. If you have insulin resistance, you're going to have a fatty liver. If you have fatty liver, you're going to have visceral fat around here. So it's all kind of connected. So the point is that you want to shoot for only doing three meals a day, okay? That's number one. But here's the thing. Some people, when they get up in the morning, are not hungry. So don't eat. Even though the breakfast is the most important, your breakfast might be delayed until lunch. If you're not hungry in that morning, don't consume any food. Only eat when you're hungry. This, this is a lie to state that you need six meals a day. It's just going to screw things up. So we don't eat until we're hungry, and then we eat. Okay. Now, if you want a little snack let's say sugar-free chocolate or whatever, you can eat that right at the end of the meal, but not in the middle of the meals, not between meals. <clears throat> if you are so hungry and ravenously craving between meals, then we have to increase a little bit more food during the meal itself, specifically fat, low glycemic fat, okay? And what that means is you have insulin resistance. That's why you have almost like a, a blood sugar issue there. And then the same thing at night, don't consume past your dinner. Okay. Now, some of my clients are doing, they're basically, they're not hungry in the morning. They eat a big lunch and they eat a dinner and they're done. Two meals. And that's incredible because you're, you're doing an intermittent fasting uh, for the next period of time. So you're going you're gonna to heal the insulin resistance and you're going to lower your set point. 
Me, I have to eat a breakfast and then a lunch, and I barely will have a dinner. I might have a small little kale shake and I'm done. So it's like two and a half meals a day. So you can do that as well. But the key is don't snack at night, okay? You can drink tea and things like that, all right? So, and then the last section, I'm going to give you a series of additional things that you can do to improve insulin resistance. Okay, so intermittent fasting is a very important thing to implement, but you don't necessarily have to go the whole day without eating. You can start with three meals and then go down to two. If you want to alternate and do every other day, you know, skip a meal, that's totally fine. The key is, as you do this, you're going to control your sugar better between meals and you won't have to eat as much because you're, think about it, when you're fasting, you're living off your own fat. If you have reserve to burn, then might as well burn that up. When you hit your goal, you don't necessarily have to do fast anymore. It's not starving your body. It's basically getting your uh, body just more efficiently to switch over to fat burning and not burn your sugar. Because if you actually can't make it to the next meal, that means that you're just burning sugar. So we have to improve this. So there's several things we can do to lower insulin, okay? Number one, apple cider vinegar helps blood sugars tremendously. So you can consume that with a meal. If you don't like it, you can consume it as a pill. Put in, but if you're going to do it in water, a teaspoon per glass, okay? Uh, fermented foods are much better for insulin than anything else. So fermented cabbage, sauerkraut, that's all really good because it has vinegar in it as well. Um, high potassium food, that would be all the vegetables. Now, here's the problem. When we do this, when we lower insulin, you're going to be living off your fat and you're going to have a lot more fat being burned which means that your liver has to process a lot more fat burning. If you do this without eating enough vegetables, you're going to end up with a fattier liver. So there is no choice. You have to consume larger amounts of greens. You can blend them, you can drink them, but you need to consume that to keep the fat flush from the liver. Um, that's the only way you're going to get rid of the fatty liver. Okay, so then we got uh, high potassium foods, that's uh, vegetables, high... Uh, Vitamin B1 is also will decrease the need for insulin. That would be a nutritional yeast, okay? Make sure you don't buy the synthetic version, though. Uh, fiber, it's also in my adrenal day formula, too. We have B1, it's a natural one. Uh, fiber, um, like if you're going to do uh, a choice between a kale shake with the fiber, like a blended versus a juice, it's better to do the fiber because the fiber buffers the insulin, okay? So we want fiber-rich foods. Celery is great. Um, fat. Consume more pure fats. Why? It's not that we're telling you that fat's going to necessarily cause you to lose a lot of weight, but it's very sustaining between the meals and it has no effect on insulin. It's going to help correct it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get you to eat enough fat so you can go longer without having to eat. The reason why we're going longer is so we can reverse the flow and not have sustained persistent insulin but have like a low insulin situation because if you have diabetes and you and you constantly have high sugar well if you don't eat you're not going to have high sugar so guess what this is really good for a diabetic I and mean, this is how you reverse diabetes because what is insulin resistance it's a type 2 diabetes but you can have a version of it, it doesn't come like this you can have a small version of it that's not it's like a pre-diabetes situation Okay, so lowering cortisol, that's with the stress, reducing the stress, doing my ad adrenal techniques, all that, removing body stress is important because cortisol releases glucose, which increases insulin, and reducing estrogen if you have too much of it. So if your period is heavy, we can do the technique on the ovaries. If you're taking estrogen, not a great idea because it's going to cause you to gain weight. Sleeping more is going to lower insulin. Exercising is going to lower insulin. We talked about vegetables, okay? So I gave you a lot of things that you can do. Uh, go ahead and start with the intermittent fasting or at least three meals and no snacks and then try to go two over time, okay? And watch what happens. Your set point is going to go down. This is how you fix a broken metabolism.